Hockey Inside Out, brought to you by Videotron. Another episode of Hockey Inside Out, joined by Chris Nyland again today, and a special appearance by HIO's own Mike Boone. Uh, we could lead this show off almost every week, it seems, with the latest P.K. Subban controversy. What was your take, Chris, on the uh, jersey tug uh, in Ottawa? Well, you know, I, uh, listen, I, for me to talk about this, I just got to tell you, when I scored a goal in the league, I was so excited. I used to jump, I, you know, I put my stick up, all that. If I thought about doing this, I probably would have done it, but I never <laughs> thought of doing it. Uh, again, I can certainly see how it might incense other players on other teams and, and maybe give them a little more drive and kind of piss them off a little bit. But, uh, you know, uh, geez, when guys are excited, they do things like that. But, it, you know, you see it around the league, Max putting a mm -hmm. gun in the holster and all that stuff. I, I think it can incite, incite teams. I, I, I can see how it can happen. Again, uh, when I scored goals, I was excited. Um, it wasn't because I was surprised, <laughs> but, um, you know, if I thought of that, I probably would have done it. If it wasn't PK, do you think it would have been such a big deal, Mike? Probably not. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always something with PK. I can identify with what Chris said, because when I used to write a, a good lead, I would jump up and wave <laughs> my pen in the air. And, <laughs> you got you to uh, appreciate the context of it, too. That was a big goal. That was an overtime mm -hmm. goal in which uh, the Habs, like, struggled to win the game. And also, they had, for some reason, the, the, the people in Ottawa took time out from thinking about their pension plans <laughs> to boo PK from the opening whistle all the way through the game. So he's going to say, yes, you know, uh, he's pulling on the crest and he's basically saying, hello, Ottawa, bite me. <laughs> I like you look, you point at the front, you see all these NFL guys who point at the name on, on the back of their jersey. Now, the Leafs were complaining about him being a chirper, Chris. Who was uh, the best chirper that you played with or against or guys who got under guys' Paul skins? Paul Lemieux chirped all the time. He's always yapping at somebody on the other team about their mother, their sister, or their wife. Um, you know, bad stuff. Stuff that I just, uh, I couldn't stand it. I know he did it to Neely one night, and it really, Cam just, like, flipped out, <laughs> attacked him, and Claude went down in turtle mode, like usual. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, he was a big chirper I played with. And you know what? Again, it, it, he, Claude didn't expect you to go out there and fight for him so much. If he chirped, uh, you know, he'd take the punch in the head and go down. Uh, very rarely would he fight, but, you know, uh, it would incense the other team. And, you know, in the end, who's going to really have to do the fighting? Yeah. Me. So, yeah. you know, I got sick of it after a while, but I still did my job. I just didn't like having a... Um, to, to back him up in those situations. Mm -hmm. His son Brendan's a top prospect for this year's draft uh, coming up. Yeah. Uh, Nathan Beaulieu, Mike, he, uh, does he look like he's ready to the, for the NHL right now from what you've seen? I Certainly he seems to have the wheels. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the offensive dimension of his game looks just fine at this stage. Uh, it takes a while, I guess, unless you're a top, top prospect to play defense in the league. But I think that'll come, you know, maybe they'll coach him up. They got they got problems on the back end. I don't see any reason why he shouldn't stick with the club yeah. compared to the other guys that they've got. And to know what he, I mean, they, they don't have a big team down mm -hmm. low, you know, and I, I like William myself. I think he, the kid's a heady hockey player. He understands the game. Um, he, he's going to mature. Listen, it, it's good to spend some time down there so you play, yes, but I think these guys, both of them are capable of be up here now, and I think it would bolster the Canadians' defense. And, again, they're, they're fighting for a playoff spot. They're going to be fighting for their lives mm -hmm. to the end of the season. Mm -hmm. He looked Now, Louis LeBlanc's called up. Uh, is this his last chance? His contract's over at the end of the season, Mike? Do you think this is, might be the last time we see him? I, I don't know. Or would they give up on a Francophone prospect at this stage of his career? Mm -hmm. Certainly He's from they the have West to be Island, though. <laughs> He's from the West Island. He's not from Shabugamo. <laughs> From <laughs> Louis LeBlanc, you, Chris. You, you, wonder LeBlanc, if, you, know? you wonder if he would have been better staying at Harvard. I know I remember oh, speaking sure. with the Harvard coach after he let him go, and he said it's not a case of getting to the NHL, it's a case of sticking in the NHL, and he thought that Louis would have been better off staying there with the weight program and bulking up. Uh, he's a skinny guy. He doesn't look that physical. I think that's really what they're missing is a physical forward. Well, yeah, Harvard. you know, and he made his moves quick. You know, he, he went uh, went to Harvard, spent a year, then to Junior Canadian, then all of a sudden he's here. And, uh, you know, I, I think he'd have been better off staying in school for a bit, play some games. 
get his confidence, work on his game, work on his self. And again, that's all hindsight and it's 2020 and great and everything. But fact of the matter is Louis now is um, in the fire. He has to come here and do something. He mm -hmm. can't come up and, you know, they, they have to play him too. He can't come here and be a fourth line player. You got to put him in a position to hopefully succeed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he definitely has some of the tools to do it. He, he got to use his skate and speed. And he's a guy you're looking to get points from. So you know, he has to do something when he's here. When they called up Nattenen for that game, he played two shifts, like one minute of ice time. Like you almost wonder, I like, wonder. Like, why I wonder. bother? Yeah. Why I think the, the jury was in quickly on him. I think he lost two face-offs, but so what? Yeah. Well, you wonder ridiculous. If you, why bring him up? You wonder if maybe they were sending shifts? a message to LeBlanc, like we're going to call this kid up ahead of you, and then you wonder if maybe there were some mind games there. Poor Eunice. I think he needs to see the team psychologist <laughs> now after that. You get up and get two shifts. I mean, what and a apparently blow. His, his family stayed up in Finland, what is it, like 4 o'clock in the oh, yeah. morning yeah, or something well, to yeah. see him? You know, at least they could have gone to bed after the first period That's anyway. True. <laughs> now, the first time you were called up by the Canadians, Chris, did, what, what are your memories of that? Where were you? What happened? I got called up. Uh, I was in Halifax. Uh, I got called up. The uh, coach at the time and GM, Bert Templeton, called me in, said I got called up. I raced home, got my bag, headed to the airport. I forgot my hockey bag. I had to go back to the Metro Center. I headed to Atlanta. Uh, I played uh, about two shifts a period. Claude Rowe kind of worked. I, I, I was nervous as, mm -hmm. as, all, as all hell. I, I was just so nervous. It's like I forgot everything I learned in the American Hockey League. And then the second game, um, you know, I went into that, and, it, and that's when I kicked in the gear. You know, it was awesome. I got an assist on the winning goal by Pierre Mondu. I fought Bob Kelly, and I arrived. <laughs> not, not a bad start. We'll be back after a short break, and uh, Chris will have his knuckles knockout for this week. And Mike will talk a little bit about the fan passion on his uh, live blog every game of Hockey Inside Out. Here's our knuckles knockout for this week. Vancouver Calgary game. You know what? I don't have a problem what happened on the ice. I have a problem with the two coaches, two guys that probably never had a fight in their lives, putting those guys into a situation like that. I know it's the NHL, I know these things can happen. Bob Hartley starting, the group of guys he started was looking for trouble. John Tortorella played into it. He could have got around it. Uh, I don't buy the thing that <laughs> if I put the Sedins out, they would have got beat up. I don't think so. Uh, he could have started another line, that's for sure. He didn't. Uh, he bought right into it. Uh, both teams went at it. Uh, they got what they deserved, both teams. And then my problem is John Tortorella. And again, I like Torts, but he should have never went down the room and confronted Hartley. Hartley uh, obviously got under his skin. But once John put those players on the ice and accepted that challenge, uh, it's too late to go down there and start yelling and threaten to beat up Bob Hartley. Although I would have liked to see that cat fight. Sure would have been a real cat fight. <laughs> they say there's no such thing as bad publicity. That fight was on the main page of YouTube. It was on Sports Center in the States. Mike, is, what, what impact does this have on hockey fans south of the border and up here? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it can be all over YouTube and, and get people talking about hockey. But what are they saying about hockey? Mm -hmm. Again, you know, the fight on the ice is not the first hockey fight in history. But Tortorella going berserko, mm -hmm. and then Malarchuk having to be restrained from going <laughs> after Malarchuk. Tortorella. I mean, this is ridiculous. This is high school WWE. stuff, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. WWE. Yeah. Now, BX has stepped in to take the face off for that. that. That must go a long way with his teammates. Right? Yeah, for sure. Like that whole does. I mean, it's, you know, it does. But, you know, what are you going to do? And you're in a situation, you've got to do the best you can when you're out there. And, you know what? I think the bad thing for hockey here is that. Um, Brian Williams from NBC Nightly News is no longer going to watch hockey. <laughs> now, Mike, every Canadians game, as uh, HAO fans know, does his live blog, and you experience the Habs fan passion firsthand, uh, Mike. Uh, what are what's it like every night for you reading over some of those comments? You know, you should address me by my full HIO <laughs> name, Stu, which is uh, Mike Boone, effing idiot. You know, <laughs> the, this kind of typical of the comments. I, I used to call it like the world's largest tavern table, mm -hmm. you know, because it's every everybody's got an opinion. Uh, they're anxious to express them. They tend to be a little bit excitable, 
I would, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a pathologist, but I suspect alcohol <laughs> involved, might be involved. Uh, <laughs> while they're watching the game, and uh, hey, it's great, you know. Every, again, everybody's entitled to their opinion. I, I, I don't get, uh, I don't get unduly depressed or, or, or swayed by things that they say mm -hmm. to me. And, uh, no. That fan passion as a player, Chris. I remember being in an elevator with you recently, and a guy got in, saw Chris Nyland, and his face dropped. I mean, you're still recognized in the city. What's the fan passion like from a player standpoint when you're playing here? Well, you know, again, there's a lot of pressure. The fans love the players; they want to see you do well. And uh, as long as you tie or win here, <laughs> you're doing pretty good. The ties, <laughs> uh, not sure, but again, the, the fans are passionate. It's the, the, come on, it's the only game in town. Yes, the Alouettes. Uh, no slight to them, but hockey is it in Quebec, and here in Montreal, it's the biggest thing, and um, it, it's a great place to play. I mean, if you can deal with that pressure, you can deal with the constant media attention, uh, you can uh, deal with the expectations, uh, you can succeed here. If not, um, you're going to flatline like Renny Bork. <laughs> Speaking of Renny Bork, uh, your buddy Mitch Melnick had Steve Bejean on his uh, show the other day. And Steve Bejean was one of my favorite players. He gave everything he had every shift. And Mitch asked him, he says, uh, what, do you, what was your impression when you'd watch a guy who didn't give it all every shift? Bejean said, it's tough to watch them. You try to talk to them. You try to tell them. But they think, you know, it's been easy their whole lives. They think they don't need to push harder when they're at the NHL level. I've seen a lot of them. Like I said, Sorry, but it pisses you off sometimes. Yeah. So I imagine there must be a few guys, Mike, in the Habs locker room. I mean, is that one game healthy scratch going to motivate this guy? What? I don't know. When, when they got him, I covered the Canadians' Western trip, and I can remember either a broadcaster or a writer in Calgary telling me that when Daryl Sutter, in, in a weak moment, signed the guy to a six-year contract, he said, Rene Borks, give a crap, meter went to zero mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know... Yeah. I, I, I don't see a revival anytime soon. And you it's know, a pity because he, you know, he can scale. He he's a tools. big guy. He's yeah. got and the he tools. Fight. He can mm -hmm. do all that. 26 and goals twice. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, uh, honestly, I, I, when I read his quote and heard his quote about uh, not playing, mm -hmm. he didn't sound pissed off at all. Mm -hmm. He sounded like, oh, well, I knew it was coming. In other words, I knew I was playing brutal. I knew this was coming. And, well... I'll get back in there. Yeah. Yeah. I know one thing, the paycheck's coming. Yeah. yeah, and hey, the hot dog's up there are pretty good. <laughs> yeah. We don't get them in the, in the, in the room between periods, yeah. it's great. Now, now, scoring is a continuous problem with the Canadians. They don't have anybody in the top 50 in scoring. They call up Louis LeBlanc, who is the leading goal scorer in Hamilton with nine goals. Michael McCarron, the first round pick last year, has six goals with the London Knights. Can you win in the NHL without having a, a sniper? That's going to be tough. I mean, you got Max. I mean, come on, mm -hmm. Max is here. But you need more than just Max, guy that can score goals. And it has to be spread around. You need that depth. The Canadians don't have it. And, you know, McCarron, six goals, so what? But he's not going to be looked to as a, a guy that's going to be a big goal scorer. He, he needs to play with his body. He needs to play physical. I know he struggled down there, but he'll come along. He's still a young kid. He's got to, got to learn the game. And, uh, again, um, yeah, yeah, look at Anaheim. You know, mm -hmm. Perry gets slapped. They get guys putting the puck in the net. Everybody, they got the depth. Yeah. Look at all the better teams. They have the depth in scoring, and the Canadians don't have that. They're, they're you know, a team with one, really one sniper, and they get a lot of their, their scoring gets generated from where? The back end. They can't score five on five. Uh, they score on the power play, yes, but five on five is where they get killed. You mm -hmm. look, they're one of the lowest scoring teams in the National Hockey League. Five and five. It's going to be a problem going forward. It'll be interesting to see if Mark Bergevin does anything to address that at the, uh, at the trade deadline. Uh, we're out of time for this week. Uh, congratulations to Anthony Calvillo on his fantastic career with the Alouettes from everybody here at HIO. And we'll see you again next hey, week with another show. A little energy. Let's end with a little energy. <laughs> a little energy. Get this man a tie. A little energy. <laughs>